Okay, hello everyone. We will get started now. So uh, welcome to the registration webinar for incoming BDCI or Bachelor of Design and City Innovation students. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Alexa and I'm the recruitment specialist at the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape at the University of Calgary. I'm joined today by Sarah, our undergraduate program specialist. And before we get started today, uh, we wanna let you know that this session is being recorded. So even if you can't join us this evening, uh, hopefully this session can be a useful tool um, so that, that you can use it uh, if you're going to be registering for BDCI courses. During the session today, we will discuss the BDCI degree structure. Uh, we'll go over the registration resources that you have access to as an incoming BDCI student. Uh, we'll review questions uh, that were previously submitted from web, uh, webinar registrants. And we'll make sure that you know how to contact us so that if you have to meet with us or if you need additional support, you'll know where to find us. Following the presentation, we'll have a question and answer period until our program ends. So if you do have a question that comes up during the presentation, please put it in the chat and then we'll answer those during the Q&A. We would like to begin the session by acknowledging and paying tribute to the traditional territories of the pe uh, peoples of Treaty 7, excuse me, uh, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Pekainai, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and by the signing of Treaty 7 in 1877, the university recognizes that we are all treaty people. Now we'll pass it over to Sarah. All right, thanks, Alexa. Welcome, everyone. So I wanted to first start off with the BDCI degree structure. Um, so the degree itself is 120 units with four years of full-time study. So there are three different pathways with BDCI. We have BDCI with the general studies, we have BDCI with the architecture concentration and BDCI with the landscape architecture concentration. So regardless of any of the pathways, uh, your degree requirements would consist of the core courses. So typically the first 60 units or two years would be the same for any of the three pathways. So those core courses would be the same. And then where it branches off is that every pathway will do a work integrated learning and capstone studios but those would be specific to the pathway that you decide on. Aside from those two studios, you're gonna then do some more BDCI pathway courses. So those are the ones specific to whichever pathway you decide. And then finally, for all three pathways, you will need to do open electives, which is 15 units or five courses. So prior to this webinar, I did send out an email with the different videos. And so just wanted to show you briefly which ones those would be and feel free to nab those links uh, temporarily and then you can watch them later on after this webinar. So the first one on the left is the registration basics. So I recommend this video for everyone who hasn't had registration experience yet. It gives you the lowdown on everything related to registration and gives you an overview of all the things that you need to do. Now the link on the right is the registration tips. So that one is kind of a summary of everything you would have learned. Um, so I recommend this for all incoming students, regardless of if you're new or if you are a current student at U of C who's transferred over to our program, it does give you um, a few tips that you should watch out for and it's relevant to everyone who is registering. And then on the left here, we have a link on registration resources. Again, this will be relevant to everyone here at U of C, um, either new or current, because it does cover a broad amount of resources that you can use throughout your registration period and potentially beyond. Now on the right-hand side, you'll find a link that's for the BDCI degree planning page. So the, these are the in-house resources we've made for all of you to use. Uh, highly recommend that you take a look there. And also any of the registration tutorial videos that I mentioned previously, they're also notice, noted on this website underneath the videos section. And then finally, just to fit them all in one page, we have the registration terminology. 
So if you're watching any of the registration videos and you're like, I don't know what that word means, this is a good place to check them out. Um, so it's split into three parts um, and each of them are titled differently. So if you really wanna know only about certain things like requisites or wait lists, you would go watch a certain video. If you need to know about registration action terminology, then you would look at a different video. So definitely take a look at any of these three videos for help with that. All right. So uh, thank you to those of you who submitted questions early. Um, we had some people who sent us um, some of their questions beforehand so that we could address them uh, during this portion of the presentation. So to get us started here, our first one is, if I don't have an enrollment start time yet, what should I do? Hand it over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Alexa. All right. So this is quite common for any students who haven't paid their $500 deposit yet. So if you're checking on your student center and you're like, hey, I'm not sure why I, I don't have a start time yet, definitely make sure you pay the deposit. And if you have paid it already, make sure you contact enrollment services to see if they have any other reasons why that's still not showing yet. So that QR code on the right hand side is the enrollment services contact page. Uh, so take a look through there if you're having this issue. Yes, thank you. And I also put the link in the chat and I will do that too, just in case you miss the QR codes. All right. So the next question here is, how do I check what transfer credit I have at UCalgary? Good question. So the QR code on the right will give you, uh, will take you to a website that talks about the whole post-secondary transfer credit process. Um, essentially, once everything is assessed by the admissions team, your transfer credit report will be on your student center. So follow the link and that will show you all the steps you need to take and check to see what transfer credits you'll have once you come to U of C. Great, okay. And the next one here, when I validate my shopping cart, I had a requisite error message for design 203, 213 and 223. Oh no, <laughs> what am I missing? Another good question. Um, so the QR code on the right will just show you more information about how the shopping cart validation works. But basically with the shopping cart validation, it only takes the courses that you have currently done uh, or currently enrolled in, and then it does its analysis that way. So what happens is for all our incoming students, your design courses, so design 201, 211, 221 are sitting nicely in your fall shopping cart. And then in your winter shopping cart, it's the prerequisites are those three courses in the fall. So what will happen is you're going to get a requisite error because it doesn't pick up any of the courses in your shopping cart itself. So this requisite error should go away once you enroll into your courses properly and I'll finally nab your, your fall courses as registered. And I would say if after that, if you registered into both your fall and winter and you still get a requisite error, at your enrollment start time, that's when you want to reach out to me. All right. Um, this person's already a U of C student, um, so but they, they can't use their NSRA anymore. Um, can they get more help elsewhere? Good question. So NSRA is the new student registration assistance, and that's made for just our incoming new students. But for our current students, we do have something for you. So Enrollment Services has put together Registration 101 workshops. And so this is just uh, their little poster on those workshops. And the QR code will take you to the calendar where you can book those sessions and see what's when they're being offered. It's a good, it's a good review for everyone. So if you need a refresher, definitely check them out. All right, and what's the difference between the BDCI program guides and the prerequisite guide? All right, looks like this parent's definitely taken a deep dive at our BDCI degree planning page here. Um, and so on the BDC, BDCI degree planning page, we have the program guides in written form as well as in a diagram form, but then we also have the prerequisite guide. So when you wanna know what courses to take in each year, each year of your degree, the program guide is the best one to use because it shows the breakdown from years one to four, as well as what to take in the fall and winter semesters in each of those years. Now, if you wanted to know the relationship between the courses in BBCI, that's when you want to look at the prerequisite guide. Um, so usually in that case, maybe you're looking at a future course and you're like, I really want to take this design course. 
then you can use the prerequisite guide to work backwards to see what courses you have to take first to get to that. And then the QR code on the right is just a link to the BDCI degree planning page. Oh dear, okay, so help. There's a hold on my account and I can't register. So Sarah, what do they do if there's a hold on the account? This can happen from time to time. So the QR code on the right uh, takes you to the registrar's page on late fees and payment issues. Typically a hold is due to some sort of strange payment. Sometimes it's due to an overdue library book that you weren't aware of. So the first thing you wanna do is just to check what type of hold is on your account. So that link on the right will take you to the process of how to check all that information. And then once you figure out what the hold is and what type it is, then you wanna to refer to the correct department to figure out how to resolve that hold. Now holds usually go down overnight once it's resolved. So the sooner you notice a hold, the better it is for you to follow up and get it resolved, just so that it doesn't delay your registration. And on the next page here, this is these are the departments that the registrar has provided uh, in regards to the hold type. So if you realize your hold is due to, let's say, parking fines, then you want to go specifically to parking services to resolve that hold itself. Unfortunately, I can't help you with it, nor can enrollment services or any of the departments if it's not the correct hold. Okay. And can um, incoming students swap or edit into a waitlisted class? You can. Hopefully, you don't have to. Um, so if a class is full, you can definitely try to get onto the waitlist. Um, so how the waitlist works is if a class opens up if there's space available, the next person in line would get put in. So when you're swapping, uh, you have to swap all course components. So not just a chunk of it, but the whole thing. So let's say you're changing data 201 for NT201 completely. So you swap the whole course completely. Um, you would stay in your original class and then you would swap into the new one only if there's space. So if it's waitlisted, it won't work. However, if you're trying to edit, so edit is when you're changing just a subcomponent of it. So let's say you're staying in the lecture, but you wanna change the tutorial or the lab section of it. If you're trying to edit a section, you actually would drop yourself from your original course to be able to join the wait list. And so you wanna be very careful about that before you edit a class that's waitlisted because you might lose out on your original one. So be very careful. And if you're not in a rush, I definitely recommend that you double check with me. Um, but in general, if you're ever doing anything like swapping or editing, make sure you never use Schedule Builder for that. Um, we've noticed that Schedule Builder may glitch or sometimes students don't check off things properly and they end up dropping from all their courses. So it's really, really traumatizing and it does happen often. Uh, and so this is why not just me, but a lot of places are telling students to avoid using Schedule Builder for the swap and edit function specifically. Great advice. That would be a nightmare to navigate. So <laughs> how, how do you find a random open elective that doesn't have any prerequisites? Good question here. Um, Definitely later in your years in the BDCI program, you might have to take some open electives and it's really hard to find some things sometimes depending on when you're trying to, to enroll into a course. But here, uh, the QR code on the right is just the login for the student center. And what we recommend is to use your student center to search for open classes that don't have prerequisites. So the next page, I'll show you some screenshots of how to do it. This was also shared by the registrar, so a very helpful um, screenshot from them. Mm -hmm. But through Student Center, you would use the course search function. And here you want to make sure that you're checking off search for open classes only. And then the cool part about course search is that you can tailor your search more. So then that's where you click on the advanced section. And here you want to select the no prerequisite um, modification. And then you want to click on search. So you can definitely add a lot more. Um, you can tailor your search a lot more, but this is the general way to look for any open classes that have no prerequisites. Okay, I'm still waiting for my transfer credit to get assessed. Uh, should I enroll after I get the results? The answer is no. Um, and so the link on the right is 
just a link to the academic schedule. Um, this will just help you with kind of noting when things happen, but the biggest thing is for, for any students, you want to enroll right away at your enrollment start time because the longer it takes for you to register, um, the more the spaces will fill up in the classes. And for BDCS students, you do have something called reserve caps for certain courses that will help you in your degree. So if you wait too long, those reserve caps will drop and other students will have, will have the opportunity to register into those seats that were originally saved for you. So you want to make sure that right away, even if you're waiting for some courses to get assessed, um, to enroll into everything that you need to do first, and then you can go back and drop anything that you don't need after the assessment comes in. So that's where the academic schedule uh, link is important because then you can use that to determine when the add date is, the drop deadline is, and that's where you want to make sure that when you're dropping a course that you drop it by the drop deadline so that it doesn't come up as a withdraw. If it comes up as a withdraw, then you will not get the tuition back for it and it does show up as a W on your transcripts. Okay, this person wanted to transfer into one of the concentrations. Why wasn't there a direct transfer and what should they take and how does this process work? Very good question. I get this question a lot from everyone. So this is definitely relevant to everyone here, regardless if you're new or if you're a current student. With BDCI, all students are admitted into the general route to begin with. So everyone starts with BDCI. And then during, usually during your second or third year, you can apply for a change of program to switch into one of the concentrations. So the architecture concentration and the landscape architecture concentration are both competitive. And so it isn't a matter of just, I've taken enough courses and I can switch in. You actually need to meet all the course requirements to be eligible for consideration. And you need to meet a certain GPA requirement. And then on top of that, because the concentrations have limited seats in there, it is a competitive process where top-down students are chosen in that manner. So it's not easy getting into all the concentrations, but I definitely recommend if you do want to pursue a concentration that you follow one of our program guides so that you take all the necessary courses to be eligible for uh, consideration into the concentrations and then doing well in your courses so that you'd be more competitive compared to the average student applying. And then that QR code on the right there um, just gives you some more information on how to get into those concentrations. And then finally, I've mentioned a few times throughout, uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, we can definitely work through things together. And sometimes if you've tried troubleshooting already, you might have things that don't seem right. Or if you're worried about dropping a course and you want to make sure, definitely want to connect with me. And so uh, we have some group advising sessions available. So that link on the right will take you to the program advising page where it actually breaks down all this information and shows the timing of all the group advising sessions. Uh, those are great because then you can, similar to here, ask questions and also hear what your peers might be asking about as well. It's a more informal way where we can connect. The other thing that you can do is you can book an appointment with me on Elevate. So once you become a U of C student, you'll have your UC ID and login information, which will allow you to access Elevate. And from there, you can book with me uh, based on my availability. And then finally, you can also email me. I can be reached at bdci at sapl.ucalgary.ca. And so I would recommend that if you are, if you have your UC ID already and you also have your UCalgary email address, make sure you're emailing me with that. So use your UCalgary email address, include your UC ID number and all of the relevant details that you need help with. So that it helps me look in, into your file in the meantime when you provide that information. Great. Okay, so I just want to remind everyone that all of those uh, QR codes and all of the kind of web pages that are relevant to some of these answers are all within the chat. So I'll direct you to the chat now um, just to make sure that you get those if you need them. And we've arrived at our question and answer period. So if you do have a question, uh, please use the Zoom button. You, you can raise your hand and we'll call on you to ask your question and we can have a chat. Or you can always also send your question within the chat uh, and then we can uh, read it out aloud for you and kind of discuss it and provide you any resources that we have um, that we maybe haven't discussed. 
I know lots of people have uh, really unique questions. And so sometimes you might feel intimidated to ask a question, but I'm sure so many people also have that question. So it's very important. Um, and so while we wait here, just for a few questions to come in, just gonna make sure that the chat is open. Okay. Oh, and, and just as a reminder, you can also send your questions to me, Alexa, um, as a private message, uh, just as these folks have started doing as well. So um, this person asks Sarah, uh, should I register for the fall semester first, uh, see how I do, and then register for winter classes um, before that, that term? Good question. So the answer is no. Uh, when you register, you want to register for both your fall and winter. Um, this is a very important point to emphasize because when registry, when your enrollment start time begins, anybody at that start time can enroll in both the fall and winter semesters. So you want to make sure that you're on it as well and you're in both of your semesters. Um, I've definitely seen in the past where students have forgotten to register for their winter and then mid fall, they're just trying to get into all their winter classes, but they're already full by then. So always remember when your enrollment start time uh, begins, enroll in both your fall and winter semester. Right. And that's why we also have those uh, those guides on the website so that you can see a full picture of what you need to um, enroll into. All right. Oh, speaking of the guides, uh, this person looked at the program guides um, and they said that they probably can't take all the recommended courses in each semester because they have a few extracurricular commitments um, or other things going on in their lives. So what should they do? Well, I would say first off, come chat with me. Um, it does happen and it is quite normal. So we have seen, like, for example, varsity athletes, we've seen students who only want to um, study part time, as an example, who need to pick and choose their courses. So definitely connect with me because all of your situations will be unique to your circumstances. So you and I wouldn't want to sit down and look through and see you know, what works, what doesn't work. Um, that This is where the prerequisite guide also is very helpful because it shows you if you can't take a certain course, what are you kind of shutting off in that certain pathway? And so we can go through to see you know, which pathways are okay to wait until later, which ones should you um, focus on in the meantime, if you, go, if you can only take a few courses. Uh, but definitely check in with me instead. That would be the best way to start this conversation. Okay. And this is another area where I think people should probably contact you, but this person is currently not a BDCI student, um, but they want to take some courses kind of related to the degree or offered within the degree because they want to transfer in next year and start that process, kind of getting a jump start. Um, is that okay? And if it is, what do we, what do we recommend? Mm -hmm. Also a good question. Yeah, definitely. Like Alexa said, you do want to connect with me. However, if you're just kind of doing some research in the meantime, um, our BDCI degree planning page is very helpful where you can look at a glance, like all the courses you have to take. And all these guides are actually built on the academic calendar, which is where all the regulations and policies are, are housed. So specifically for BDCI and the degree, degree requirements, those are actually on the academic calendar. And so students can use that to check all the required courses. And I would say if you are um, a current USC student, you also have access to a tool called Academic Requirements. So if you pull that tool out, um, but switch it and use the what if report, if you use the what if portion of that, you can actually look at the BBCI program. And that will also show your report of what courses you've completed already and what you're still missing. So I'll give you an idea of all the things that you might need to take in, uh, in the meantime. But I would say once you've done that research, definitely connect with me um, so we can look at it more closely and then chat more about what are the things that you need to do as you prepare for getting into BBCI. Okay, um, this person is worried about their study permit um, because there might be a delay. We know that there's been delays kind of in the last few years regarding study permits and things. So what should they do um, and kind of do, do you know about the timelines that we're looking at? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a good question, but unfortunately I can't really answer that. It's outside of my purview, mm -hmm. but I'll get Alexa just to help me to share a link to the International Student Services. 
So that link will uh, provide you more information about everything that you need to do as an international student, as well as who to contact. So we do have international student advisors who can help you and chat with you about your study permit, uh, what you need to do when you're here in Calgary or things that you need to prepare for, or if you're encountering any issues with your study permit itself, or there's something going on with the government in your country, um, they are the first to reach out to so that they can figure out what you need to do in the meantime to maintain your admissions or, or what to do as your next steps. Okay. Yeah, and I did pop that chat or that uh, link there in the chat, just in case. Uh, okay, thanks, Sarah. Okay, we have another question here. Um, this person said that they noticed in the fall semester, there's a sustainability lecture right before the design 201 and 211 labs on Tuesday and Thursday, but it says non BDCI degree students only. Is there a reason for this? Yes, thank you so much for noticing that. Um, so the reason why we have said it that way is there are two sustainability 201 classes, and one of them is specifically for the BBCI cohort. Um, and so that would be actually the, the earlier lecture where we want everyone in. And the reason why we split it that way is to give you some time before you go into your lab. Um, the lab itself can be quite busy and just kind of in terms of pedagogy, in terms of um, giving students adequate time to prepare for their lab. We want to make sure that you're not coming from one class and then rushing to your lab. Uh, and usually, based on our what I've seen, what we've seen in SAPL is that students like to have a little bit of time prior to their lab to prepare or to connect with their instructor or to catch up on things before it starts. So that's why there's a gap in between. And um, all BTCI students have to take the same sustainability lecture. Um, so you can actually split between two because we are following a cohort system. So you're pretty much all going to be in the same classes for the first couple of years. Okay, great. These are great questions. So thank you for, for your participation and uh, thanks for noticing those, those details about your registration. Um, we have another person who's asked, and I'm not sure if this is directly related to registration. So if it's not, that's okay. But Sarah, they're kind of asking like, what what are the other steps um, before they they kind of arrive? Like what what more can they do to make sure that they're they're fully prepared? Yeah, well, there's there's a lot. Um, but as a new student, incoming student, you're actually going to also be getting a lot of information from us, both from SAPL as well as from the admissions team. So definitely keep an eye out on your emails um, because you will be getting some emails that will, especially from us uh, on a monthly basis, you'll get something like, hey, these are things you wanna be mindful of. Here's some links to different things that you can do. And we'll give you those reminders throughout uh, from now up until when you start with us and same with the admissions team. So things like setting up your email account, setting up your, your IT account, um, looking into residence, looking into certain things. So all of those are available through these emails. So I would say definitely keep an eye out for those. Um, it can be a lot of information and it can be overwhelming. So if you ever find that you're reading that email and you're like, I really don't understand all the words that you're using here, you can always forward that email to bdci at sapple.ucalgary.ca with your specific question. And we can go through that together. Or if you, uh, if you want to, you can also book an appointment with me and we can chat about that together. Great. I know it can be overwhelming, hey? It's a lot of information. Yeah. Um, and we have another question here. People, they're registering, they're like getting their, their themselves prepared to register and everything. And they're, they're wondering about the experience of how it will be, like if they're going to be moving from class to class, um, like if they'll, like you mentioned the cohort, I think that's what kind of uh, sprung this on. So how will the, how will the degree kind of first term be experienced by the students? I would say um, the first year is going to be pretty nice uh, because we're doing a cohort system and we're doing somewhat similar to like a home, like a homeroom style experience for all of you. So you're going to have your own desk in the studio classroom and our most of our professors will be cycling through the classes. So you get to stay in the classroom, you have your own private area and you're going to be able to engage with the instructors in the same room and also engage with your your cohort uh, your peers in the same room so there's only a few classes where you're outside of that area so sustainability would be in a different room and other courses like data 201 is online as well as mt 201 would be in a different classroom 
But what we've done is, again, with kind of that planning, we've made sure that you have adequate time to travel between your, your studio room to the other classroom on our campus. Okay, thank you, yeah. All right, I'm just gonna make sure that we've captured this. Um, I also have a question. I know someone sent a direct message to me. Um, let's see here. So they wanna know where to find their enrollment start times. So your enrollment start time is going to be on your student center. So I do recommend that you watch the course registration, what, when, and how. Um, that video will show you where to find it uh, and it has all the links in there as well. Uh, but it, like short answer is student center, how to do it, check out the video. Awesome, yes. And we have another question here about um, course load. So this person is wondering if the, the way that we recommend students um, register for courses, if they can't you know, take one or two, I think we mentioned this previously in the presentation with extracurriculars, but maybe we can just go through it again, just to make sure people have peace of mind as far as how many courses we recommend they take their first term. Yeah, so typically if you wanna finish your degree in four years, then you wanna take 30 units per year, which will add up to the 120 units. So that means you're basically taking 15 units per semester, which is a full course load. So this is a heavy course load, um, especially if you are trying to adapt um, from high school to university. So for some students that might not be the best workload, uh, but it will depend on your situation. So some students who are geared for, for university have time to focus on it, um, that 15 units per term will be manageable. But if you're doing other things, like let's say I mentioned before, varsity athlete, or you have other extracurriculars, or you have to work uh, part-time, or you're volunteering on top of that, then you wanna look at how many you can kind of handle per semester. Because if you're taking too many courses, it can be quite overwhelming as well. And then you don't end up doing well in your courses because you're stressed and pulled in so many different ways. Um, that being said, our recommended, uh, our program guides are for the recommended four year progression. Um, that's typical in any of the other degree programs. Um, students will come in expecting to graduate in four years. So we do plan it that way for you. Um, so that means it's the 15 per semester. And um, usually each course is around three units, but in SAPL, some of our courses are actually six units long because those are usually our studio courses and they will come up in our second year and onwards. And so that difference between the six units and the three units is just that there's gonna be more time spent on that course. And so our studio courses, as I've mentioned before, they do take a lot of time and effort. Um, you're doing a lot of hands-on work, you're connecting with your instructor and your peers. So typically you will find yourself spending a lot more time in studio each week um, and that's why instead of having, let's say, five courses in that semester, you're having four courses because your one studio is taking up the, the time of two courses, essentially. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. I hope that clears that up, but please let us know if you have any follow-up questions about that specifically. I know I got we got another question come in while you were explaining that. Um, if this person were to take a computer science course rather than the ENTI course, um, first year as outlined in the plan, would that negatively impact anything? No, it won't. Um, so I would say that if you look at, um, if you look at any, the prerequisite guide for BDCI, um, you'll notice that the prerequisites are based on just those specific sample courses. So ENTI is kind of outside of that area, but it's within the entrepreneurship realm that we want to include within BDCI itself. So that is a course that you can definitely take later on if you prefer, it doesn't affect um, any of your progression. But the one thing to keep in mind is to double check the change of program page if you're trying to switch into a concentration. I don't have it with me right now just to double check, but for that change of program, that link shows you all the courses you have to complete by a certain period to apply for your concentration. So if ENTI is, is part of that requirement, you just want to make sure that you've cleared it or you will finish it in that cycle so that you can switch into the concentration. 
Yeah, great questions, though. I know that it can be um, a little bit complicated trying to figure out exactly what you're going to register for. But once it's all done and you have peace of mind so that you know that you're registered and that you've cleared everything, that's really the goal here. It's making sure that you feel supported and that you know exactly what uh, you should be taking when um, so that you can you focus on your studies rather than on um, the stress of, of planning out your degree like this. So Sarah is a great resource for for you um, meeting with her speaking with her emailing her um, just to make sure that you these little these little nuanced things um, for your planning is, is very important um, so thank you all right um, so I just want to allow people um, a few more minutes just to uh, send in their last minute questions here I think we've covered almost everything in the chat just going to double check. If I didn't get to your question, but you have sent it, please resend it. Um, I've sent a lot of links in there. Just want to make sure I get to everyone's questions. All right. Great. Okay. Okay. Also, um, Sarah, uh, someone's just asked about, so I think you mentioned this already, but we'll just confirm the courses are, are pr primarily or even all of them offered on main campus for the first term. That's correct. So for this first year, it will be on main campus. Um, and I would say just stay tuned in terms of where the location of the classes will be in future years. For now, just for first year, um, we found that it would be easier for all students to kind of be close by, as well as to get um, familiar with our campus. So as undergrad students, um, if you're new to UFC, it's nice to kind of check out the facilities here and learn about the different areas on our campus, especially like Mac Hall or like our student wellness services, or we have a gym there. So all those things you want to check out as a first year. Um, and then in future years, as we build, uh, as we develop the other courses, and then we decide kind of where to offer them that would work best for your program, that's when you will start to see the different rooms and the changes to that. So I'd say pay attention to that. We don't have too much information about it, but kind of reminds me of a previous question about kind of planning and the experience of moving to classrooms. Once you're in future years, and if we if you do end up going to the CBD lab, so our uh, which is downtown for your classes, and if you are taking open electives at the same time, which might be on this main campus, this is where you start doing that Tetris work where you're looking at okay, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm at I'm downtown, so I want to make sure that my open elective, which is on main campus, is on the other days or at a time where it allows you uh, enough commute time to get to one place and the other. Yeah, great, great uh, note there about the commute. Um, uh, this person, their follow-up question is, will there still be opportunities to kind of go to our other campus uh, and check that out in any capacity or are they only confined, I guess, to the, the main campus? No, you can definitely go explore. Um, welcome to check out the CBD lab. It's actually super cool. Um, and also SAPL organizes a lot of events. So as when you're a student here, you're going to get a lot of no notifications like, hey, Design Matters is happening. And Design Matters usually happens uh, downtown in the CBD lab. And those are presentations on different things related to um, SAPL, things like sustainability, things like um, buildings and things that might be important to us in terms of how we want to structure things. Uh, so lots of different topics. Um, obviously, I'm not the one offering them, so I can't give you the lowdown on it, but you will get a lot of information about it, a lot of invitations towards it. And so then you can go, um, you can RSVP and attend those events. I know there was one, like a several months back that was also done with our mayor. Um, so she was part of, uh, she was one of the guest speakers, and they were talking about um, a SAPL related topic. Um, so I'd say like lots of opportunities to do that. And even also I want to show some love for our main campus here. Uh, we have the Stantec Gallery, which is right outside the SAPL office. And even that we have events, you know, month, every month or so um, that is around that Stantec Gallery. So then there's another opportunity for students to meet our faculty, meet the presenters and, and learn more about what's being shown in the gallery itself. Yes, uh, please, you know, feel free to, to join us for as many of these things as you can. 
uh, start to understand kind of our our community of Sapple with our uh, international and, and kind of national, even local uh, thought leaders and design experts and people who you can begin to network with, even in the upper graduate program as well. And uh, it's really exciting for for you to be joining us um, for some of these uh, upcoming events too. So please feel free to start joining if you can. Um, they're open to the public and uh, yeah, we've got some really cool and exciting and even interactive stuff that you can do with us. Um, okay, well, I think we've captured everything in the chat. So I just wanna um, close the the recorded part of the session here and just thank everyone. Um, remind everyone again that if you need additional support or have questions um, beyond just this session, uh, Sarah is there to support you. So please feel free to email us at bdci at sapl.ucalgary.ca or visit our undergraduate program um, advising page. Uh, we're always happy to su uh, support you as you move through uh, this transition to starting the BDCI program. Um, so I also want to thank everyone who joined us today and Sarah for your presentation and everyone for your engaging questions. Um, it was excellent. So I will end the recording here. So thank you.